John chapter 4. So last week, Jesus departed Judea, and rather than going around Samaria, as the Jews despised the Samaritans so much, um, they didn't even want their dust to be on their feet. But they, they would go around Samaria and travel to the east side of the Jordan, and then go up north and then make their way into Galilee. But they would totally avoid, <laughs> avoid uh, Samaria, but they would cut into Galilee. But Jesus needed to go through Samaria. That was emphasized last week. He needed to go, and the King James Version said he must go into Samaria. And he rested in a town called Sychar, known as Shechem. Jesus sat down by Jacob's well, and a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus asked for a drink. And I love the way he did it. He says, give me a drink. <laughs> Which sparked up an interesting dialogue, being that she is a Samaritan and a woman, and Jesus a Jew. We learn from a long history that there was animosity between the two races, but Jesus in this meeting only cared about winning her soul. He spoke to her about living water, where whoever drinks of it will never thirst. And when she learned of this living water that only he can give her, it created in her not only a curiosity of who she was speaking of, but a thirst for this living water. However, Jesus had to point out her sin that she was trying to hide. Because before anybody, any one of us, can go to Jesus, we need to recognize that we are a sinner. And this woman had five husbands previously, and she was with a man that she wasn't married to at that moment. And as quickly as he revealed her sin of adultery to her, she quicker, you know, the quickly she turned and changed the subject. She wasn't wanting to go down that road. She talked of the Messiah who is to come and who will tell everything to them. Jesus at that moment revealed himself to her when he answered, I who speak to you am he. Now, the disciples are coming back from the city with food, only to be very surprised to see Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman. And our text begins in verse 27. It said, And at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no one said, What do you seek? Or, Why are you talking with her? I wanted to kind of stay right here for just a second. So they marveled at Jesus. Why? He was talking to a Samaritan, and the Samaritan was a woman. And this, this went against all Jewish cultural correctness, all right? Jesus was literally crossing beyond the boundaries that Jews would never consider doing. But it's interesting. Though they didn't ask these questions, the Apostle John is very transparent, writing their inner thoughts down as to what they were all thinking to the woman, what do you seek? Or to Jesus, why do you talk to her? By their response from their heart, we would look at them and go, man, that's a bit harsh, man, right? But they never, obviously never, even in this moment, considered themselves. Who they were, where they were from, little poor towns around the Sea of Galilee. It never crossed their minds to think, well, if he can choose me, he can choose anyone. And here's John, the one that Jesus loved, he marveled. And here's Peter, Mr. Rough Around the Edges, who became the rock, he marveled. The disciples saw this, and they all marveled, meaning it was an intense surprise, like, what, what, what? You know, they were like, what is going on? But it's pretty amazing you know, when we witness someone coming to Christ, mm -hmm. right? It's amazing. It's like, I consider it a miracle mm -hmm. watching this person coming from the dead and being resurrected in him. Especially the ones that we've counted out. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no way that they would ever come to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we don't even bother talking to them. With that heart, we're no different than the disciples. But Jesus talked to her and loved her shared the truth with her, just as he did us. Mm -hmm. And God, the Father, he reached out to creation without race, 
stature, or any qualifications in mind. You know, we're all created in his image, and God desires for all to come to him. So here's a reminder to us, myself included. We are no different than anyone who was born into this world in Adam. Whether someone is hooked on drugs or sells it, someone who's a partier, an alcoholic, or as simple as one who is completely different than us. We can't forget that they are, there are those who have it all together as well that we don't even think about. We are, and I have to ask the question, why are we reserved with people in high statuses? If you really think about it, not only are the different people we don't talk to, or the high statuses, or the people we're familiar with, we just assume, we've really put ourselves in a comfortable bubble, haven't we? That's, that's, that's a problem. That's a problem for all of us, and I, and I include myself. You know, I go out, and I love talking to people. You know, but sometimes, if I, like I was today at you know, Popeye's, and there's this lady, I just want to say, you know what? I wanted to say, but why didn't I? Mm. God loves you. Mm. You know, even if you're having a rough day, God loves you. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. We need to stop looking at the outer appearance of people and start looking at people as souls. Mm -hmm. And with that, reminder number two, we all need a savior to be born again, right? So who are we to choose who we want to share the gospel with? Do you think that your lack of love for that soul, whatever the case may be on the appearance or outside, I don't know what they look like, you know, or smell like, but do you think that your lack of love for that soul can outdo the lack of love they are already receiving? There is no love like the love from God. And we must never forget where we came from. We should be all seeking for the Lord's heart of compassion in us. And again, I say this including myself, we all need to seek the Lord's heart in all that we do. Amen? Amen. So the disciples came and just awkwardly stood there, quietly, holding their thoughts and didn't ask Jesus any questions, but just stood there waiting while he was revealing himself to her. Have you ever been in a, engaged in a, in a great discussion or conversation with someone and then someone just comes right up on the side, you know, and just stands there waiting for you and just kind of looking at you uh, so you can kind of acknowledge them, so you can revert your attention to them. Meanwhile, you could be sharing the gospel with this other person, which Jesus literally was. <laughs> I've been interrupted just so one can say hello to the one I'm talking with when we were just about to pray over their need. We've all been there. We've all been there. Oh, and we've all stood there waiting too, doing that for somebody. You yeah. know, I've done it. So tonight, I have something special for you guys. I have a Barney video called Good Manners. So Leslie, let's roll the video. <laughs> no? <laughs> I just played. Barney like the dinosaur? But between Jesus and the, women, the woman, the conversation did end under that circumstance. Jesus just revealed himself to her while the disciples walked up and stood there marveling. Who knows what their faces look like? So she left. In verse 28, the woman left. And the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city. So she left and left her water pot too. Jesus just told her that she was speaking to the Messiah who told her all things concerning herself. Her mind was taken completely off guard, right? Usually when people forget what they originally came to do, you know, they were probably excited or shocked or just blown away. And I will add, she didn't bother to carry the water pot, that heavy water pot. She was ready to go and start telling people what she just experienced. And I believe first she walked away, and then when the excitement started to grow quickly, it progressed to running. And she made her way to the city and said to the men, verse 29, Come, 
see a man who told me all the things that I've ever did. Could this be the Christ? Here she is sharing her experience. Not only does she acknowledge that a certain man conversed with her, but this man supernaturally told her all things that she ever did. And to even share this, I'm sure wasn't a proud moment for her, considering her past. But she told the men, and she seemed freed enough to share her truth, that it was the power of Jesus to read her heart and showed her to herself. She was pointing at his anointing and leads the men to this important question. Could this be the Christ? Even though Jesus revealed to her that he was, she did not say that he was to the men. She put it as, you need to come and see, observe for yourself. She believed in her heart that Jesus was the Messiah, but she didn't express it because she knew the men at that time didn't like to be taught by a woman such as her. So being humble, she was very, very wise. And the men listened to her every word, became thirsty for this living water as well. And look what happened next. Verse 30 says, Then they went out of the city and came to him. I'm sure when this group of men started out to him, started walking, probably started off with maybe 10 guys maybe, but the more as they're walking and people are starting to see these group of people just looking excited, I'm sure more started to kind of tag along, hey, what's going on? And as, as they were making their way, slowly the group would grow into a big, huge crowd. So we have this crowd of people making their way to Jesus. Verse 31, in the meantime, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? This is pretty interesting how Jesus responded to his disciples. And here's why. When we are weary and tired and need energy because we haven't eaten all day, we usually stop what we're doing and eat, right? The disciples recognized it and urged him to eat, but rather than taking the food stopping what he was doing and taking the food and eating it, Jesus knew what was coming. And so Jesus draws their minds down a deeper channel, something he wanted to share with them, a deeper, refreshing, and satisfying food to feed off of. In 30, verse 34, he says, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So there is this food that refreshed and satisfied Jesus, and we are to seek it. How? By doing the will of God and finishing his work. There is nothing more satisfying than doing the work of the Father. Charles Spurgeon said, God's will was his will, not only passively, but actively, so that he wished to do it. And God's work was his work completely, so that he wished to finish it. And Jesus explains this to us. He says, when our will is aligned to do his will and to finish the work of his work, there's a deeper refreshment and satisfying food that completely fills us inside. Have you ever seen someone receive Jesus into their hearts? Have you ever seen someone being baptized in their face full of tears mm -hmm. because of what the impact was on them that Jesus had on them? It's refreshing. It's satisfying. It fills my heart when I see that. It pumps me up and motivates me. It's just about reaching souls. And this is the food that Jesus is speaking of. It's just like, hey, that can wait. Yeah. <laughs> you know, amen, right? Then Jesus continues, do you not say, there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are all ready white for harvest. So he takes a man's common way of thinking and opens their eyes to the spiritual way of thinking and told them to behold and lift up their eyes. The crowd was coming. They were making their way to him. He says, look at the fields or the people, for they are already white for harvest. 
Their hearts were ready to receive salvation. They were ready to hear the truth. They were wanting to know who this Jesus was. Is he the Christ? Well, by the way she was speaking, I can, I'm going to go and invest my time mm-hmm. to see and hear what he has to say. Jesus planted the seed in the Samaritan woman. And then she turned around and planted the seed in many people who received her truth. There probably was some people that didn't, you know, mm-hmm. but probably a lot of women. And all we hear is the men, right? <laughs> but then Jesus says, and he who reaps receives wages. Basically, if you work, you're going to get paid, right? But he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. It's kind of like when I look at that, I think of, you know, the, the person that is standing there holding the fishing rod and it gets by, is going to pull, pull the fish in, right? You reap the reward, the reward of catching the fish. And he says, he who reaps receives the wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. Mm-hmm. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. So in this whole setting, Jesus is the sower. He sowed the seed, and the seed is the word. And through the seed he planted in the Samaritan woman, she planted many more seeds, and the disciples were about to enter into this wonderful blessing that Jesus had prepared for them. The reaping of blessing, leading people to Christ. It's a joyful occasion. It is very, very much a blessing to to lead someone to Christ. They didn't do any of the work, though, because it was already done. But we'll be laboring to reap the souls of this harvest. This, and we've all experienced it before, is more satisfying and filling than choosing to stop to eat. Verse 39, it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him, Because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, but for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. I say amen to that. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you here, us, when you labor and you sow for the Lord, don't get discouraged. If they don't right away receive Jesus, don't get discouraged. Just be faithful and plant the seed and pray for one to reap that harvest. And Jesus says, In verse 37, he said, For in this the saying is true, one sows and one another reaps. But I will say that sowing is such a vital part. I've seen more people trying to strong arm someone to the Lord. I've seen others get frustrated and throw their hands up. You know, whether it's a friend or a family member, they get frustrated. I'm telling you that in those situations, You need to recognize you were called to sow. Those times you were called to sow, not to reap. Mm -hmm. Very seldom do you get both. And when you get both, that is a huge blessing. Mm -hmm. But our focus isn't always just to go straight for the reaping. It's to plant the seeds. And when you do sow, sow with love. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 3, he says, Love is patient. When you're sowing, you need patience. Love is kind. It doesn't get offensive, right? Love does not envy or boast. Well, let me argue about that because, you know, my God, it is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Well, let me tell you something. (laughs) What my Bible says is right. You may be right but the way you're presenting it. There's no love in that. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, for love never fails. So our hearts are to sow his seed into people by how we live and maybe through words. Remember, for some, it may be the first time they've ever heard about Jesus or the truth. Others, it may have been their fifth time that you come and talk with them, but you might be the one that talks them, you know, into receiving the Lord, and maybe they're ready for it. So don't get discouraged. Just be faithful. Be faithful to sow. Now, Jesus was asked to stay for two days, and he did. I'm sure they wanted to, to know more about him and to listen to every word he had to say. And I'll tell you what, I know I did. When I first came to the Lord, I was just like, I want to learn everything about him. And that's what they were doing. And he was gracious enough to say, you know what, I'm going to spend some time with you. Mm -hmm. So verse 43 and 40 through 44, he says, Now after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So they left Samaria, and Jesus testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. That was an interesting study, but I did come to my conclusion. Because some people say, well, he was born in Nazareth. Or um, his country is considered Galilee because that's where he stayed most of his time. But given in the context, Jesus in the beginning of chapter 4, verse 3, says he left Judea first and went through Samaria. He left Judea, and the Greek word left is aphiami, meaning dismissed. In other words, he dismissed Judea and departed to Galilee. He wasn't received well and was without honor. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in southern Judea, born from the tribe of Judah. And although he was raised in Nazareth, Judea was his home, his own country, where he visited and cleansed the temple and baptized. And I'm sure if things went well in Jerusalem, he probably would have stayed there. But instead, Jesus' ministry was headquartered in Capernaum. Capernaum yeah centered around Galilee. And he came to Galilee, where he was received by the Galileans, having seen all the things. Now, these, a lot of these people witnessed a lot of, you know, him cleansing the temple. And that was a big thing, you know, getting all the money changers out there. Mm -hmm. And you know how the people believed, and just by what he, what he did, but not who he was, a lot of these people were there. You know, they saw everything uh, that he did because they were, they had gone to the feast. And I also want to make mention and make note that Jesus went to the Jewish feasts. All right, he was obedient to the law as well. So he observed all those feasts. But then Jesus goes specifically to Canaan, where he did his first miracle. So verse 46, so Jesus came again to Canaan of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, the certain nobleman, and the language doesn't speak of a Roman official, that, because I was like, okay, wait a minute. Is this a, a Roman guy? Who is this, a nobleman? It wasn't a centurion official as well. But this nobleman word speaks of like a civic leader or a position in government, and most scholars believe that he would be related to King Herod. Okay, for officials were of the bloodline, a kingsman or a royal official, so he was part of that bloodline of King Herod. He was very rich and wealthy, and so were the kids. And they're the bloodline, so they'll never have to worry about a job. They were all set. But yet, this guy having high stature, being in a, in a, in a royal position under the king, the wealth, all the wealth you can need, this, this nobleman wasn't without problems. Just like anyone, any one of you and us in this room. And there are certain things in life that we face that are no respecters of persons. Mm -hmm. And this, his problem had to do with his son. His son was sick in Capernaum, but not just sick. He was deathly ill. 
So when he, verse 47, heard that Jesus had come out of Judea and into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And I thought, again, another part of this is pretty interesting because he must have heard of the miracles of Jesus, first of all. Somebody must have told him, hey, you need to talk to this guy. He's done this. He's done that. But also, it's almost as if he had people looking out, like lookouts for Jesus, because somebody reported to him that Jesus was back in town. So he went to him in Cana. Now, Cana was approximately about 20 to 25 miles from, from Capernaum. Yet, you know, there was no stopping this man. Nothing was more important to this nobleman than his child. No title, no position, or wealth. None of that was important to him. It didn't mean anything. His child meant everything. So the only thing he could do, and a lot of us do, is turn to Jesus. But as soon as he heard, he took off urgently. Time was of the essence. He found Jesus and implored him. In other words, he begged him mm -hmm. to come down to heal his son. You know, and it's one thing for us to read this tonight, but it's another thing when your child is sick to the point of death. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do? What can you do? And I'm sure this man, being very wealthy, had paid all the doctors and physicians to come, and I would also venture he had access to the very best. But nothing was working. What do you do? And here he is, eagerly waiting for Jesus makes his way to him and begs, a grown man begs him to go down with him to his son. But what he will soon find out is that Jesus doesn't need to be physically present. And how is this? Well, John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was God. You're going to see the word in action. Jesus is God. So he begs Jesus to come down 20 plus miles with him and heal his son. And then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. <laughs> by saying you people, and people in the Bible is italicized, mm -hmm. meaning Jesus was speaking to a group. And it's interesting that Jesus rebukes them because unless they see signs and wonders, they would not believe. And this was the same thing he was dealing with when he was cleansing the temple. You know, so these people were just there. Okay, you know. But this nobleman already showed up, right, in faith. And that's what makes this a very unique thing. See, Jesus is not interested in faith that is based off signs and wonders. He was looking for the real deal thing, to believe in who he was. The guy already had a little bit of spark of faith coming, coming towards him because he left his son. But by rebuking them for this, he seemed to be pretty unhappy right, about it. But yet, Jesus wants to heal his son. But it won't be on the nobleman's terms or anybody else watching Jesus chooses to use this miracle to build people's faith. On the word of God alone, not on the basis of signs and miracles. In other words, he's going to make the man use faith in him by his word and word alone. He already showed some faith, leaving his son's bedside. But the faith of leaving without Jesus back to his son, that's another story. So the noble him said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your son lives. As a father, it would have been very hard for me to leave without him. I would be kind of petrified hearing those words, Go your way. Yeah, your son lives. But with the authority that Jesus spoke, I, all, I can only imagine what convinced him in that very moment to put all his trust and faith in him. He believed in him. 
This miracle took this man's act of faith to believe Jesus, not by seeing the miracle or physically putting him in the position with his son to, to accomplish this miracle, but by putting his complete trust in him based off his word alone. Go your way, your son lives. And all that, his faith, by responding, his act, putting it into works, activated the power of this miracle, fully convinced. The moment that he received it and obeyed, I believe that's when the miracle happened. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And just by leaving him, you know, back without Jesus took tremendous faith, I'm telling you, but his, and the difference is, is that his child's life depended on him, mm -hmm. right? Verse 51. And as he was going down, making his way back home, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. This scene was a joyful one. Mm -hmm. Hearing the screams from his servants saying, Your son lives. Dude, he lives. He's going to be okay. Everything is good. He's totally fine. The fever left. It's all gone. And those words greeted this noble man and freed him from the weight of the world that was on his back. From absolute like terror or just nightmare into instant joy and relief. Then he inquired of them, and this is cool, of the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed. And his whole household also. Now he just didn't, he didn't just believe in Jesus' word, but believed in who he was. It was that moment. It just came alive in him. And his whole household believed in Jesus as well. Isn't it amazing that when the man of the house or the wife get fully, fully engulfed with the Lord, how that alone, that water that flows through them can affect the whole family. This man, it was, his whole life was changed because of Jesus. And through this man, it, it just affected his whole family. And they all believed in Jesus as well. So Jesus healed this boy from death as soon as his words came out of his mouth. And his little body obeyed the Lord. Only one who is divine can do this. Only God, the Son, is able. Verse 54. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. And of course the word sign, which the actual word's meaning is miracle. And through this miracle, Jesus teaches us how we are to receive him. So first, faith in him. Second, believing his word. And lastly, acting in obedience. It wouldn't be based on miracles and wonders. But when you receive Jesus through faith, believing and acting, even us in this room were resurrected to life. Mm -hmm. And that's a miracle. In other words, the miracle happened after. We did all the faith, the believing. Okay. So I'm going to close with this. After reading these two different historical events, I couldn't help but to notice that we have two different people. One of high stature, with a little, yeah, I would say more without much knowledge of Jesus. One with low moral stature, with some knowledge of the Messiah to come. I'll even go further beyond these two. One of high religious stature, having a huge amount of knowledge of Scripture, Nicodemus. But these people all have one thing in common, a soul. Nothing from the outside even mattered. Nothing. It was their inside that God saw, not the outside. And Jesus sees these people from an internal perspective. He sees everyone that he's around, like if you, you know, was walking around, like if we were walking around and we're going through a mall and we see people coming this way. He sees everyone uniquely as a soul. 
but he also sees eternity and how fragile and time is. He's never concerned with any of the, the rebuttals. He's never concerned with the argument. He's never concerned with, oh, am I going to look bad? Oh, they're going to attack me, or are they going to say these things to me? He was never concerned with the Samaritan woman if she would have rejected him or laugh in his face. He still spoke to her in love. He saw the nobleman who was high in stature, probably pretty well respectable, royal blood. But that didn't matter to Jesus. He not only gave his son life, but gave him life. And through him, his family received life. The seed kept going. And these were all people. And here's the truth about every person on earth. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as we saw earlier in chapter 3, it says, he who does not believe is condemned already. So the people that we see already stand condemned. We can't assume that this person already knows. We can't look down at somebody and hope somebody else speaks to them. And we can't be reserved with somebody with high stature that we can't be ourselves around them. Our identity is, a, is children of God. The good news is, but God so loved the people of this world that he sent his son Jesus, not to condemn the people as the devil tries to convince their minds, they're already condemned. Oh, he's just going to put rules on you. You're, you're just this. You're never going to meet up to them. That's a lie. Jesus came to save the people in the world. And whosoever believes in him through faith will be saved for eternity. Now listen up. This is where I want us to listen. All you who sow, which is us. All you who reap, which is also us. Take the lesson Jesus demonstrated to his disciples with the Samaritan woman. Respond in love. Reach out and respond in love. Sow to their soul, not appearance. If God tells you, hey, I want you to talk to that person, don't look at them as, oh man, person's freaky or oh man I'm intimidated oh man this person might beat me up he says look at their soul look at their soul not their parents take the lesson from Jesus that he showed to the nobleman respond in faith believe in his word obey and act if God tells you to go talk to that one respond in faith Lord I have faith in you I believe in you that you have this all worked out for the good I'm going to act on it and finally, in the words of Jesus, Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Amen? Amen. All right, let us pray.